Get ready for your weekly dose of pixie dust with Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show, I have two fantastic interviews for the price of one. And by price, I mean free. In today's main segment, I speak with Jordan Dabby, who is a producer for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. If you live in the United States, you know that the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is as much a part of the Thanksgiving holiday as is turkey and football. I am a huge fan of the parade, and one of my favorite elements are the giant character balloons that float through the streets of New York City. So I was absolutely thrilled to chat with Jordan about the Disney character balloons in the parade throughout the years, as well as some overall Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade history. Plus, did you know that there was a year when you could see some of the Macy's character balloons in a Disney park? We chat about it all, but that's not all. After that, I conduct a short interview with author Tim O'Day about his newest book, A Portrait of Walt Disney World, 50 Years of the Most Magical Place on Earth. It's all coming your way right after this. All right, Thanksgiving is here, which means that Black Friday and all of that holiday shopping is just around the corner. If you're looking for magically inspired merchandise, look no further than Who's It's and What's It's. Who's It's and What's It's has some seriously deep cut merchandise inspired by some of your favorite Disney movies. I dare you to check out their website to see if even you, an uber Disney fan, can recognize all of the references made in their merch. It's the type of apparel that if someone sees you wearing it and they get the reference, you know that they're in the know, and that's just cool. From t-shirts to hats, beanies, jewelry, pins, and everything in between, it's all available for you to get for yourself or as a holiday gift. Simply click on the link in this episode's description to check out everything they have, and don't forget to use code DCTC when checking out to save 15% off of your entire order. I'm not just talking about one item that you purchase. I mean anything and everything that you buy, you'll get 15% off simply by using code DCTC. What makes Disney magic more magical? The holidays. Hello, Jordan, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. I gotta tell you, I am very excited to talk to you today about the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade because I am an uber fan of the parade, and it's just not the holiday season without it. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thrilled to be here, and as much as you're a fan of the parade, I'm a I'm a Disney fan. So I've been looking forward to this call for a while now, and, and, and uh, it should be a blast. Excellent, excellent. Now, most of my listeners live in America, but for those who don't, they might not be familiar with the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Can you give them a brief overview and kind of history of the parade? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was started in 1924 by our Macy's colleagues, and many of them were immigrants from all over the world, and, uh, and they wanted to create an event that was reminiscent of the festivals and the carnivals that they grew up with. Um, So the first few parades uh, were actually called the Macy's Christmas Parade, uh, even though the event itself took place on Thanksgiving. Uh, And a lot of the elements that you saw were were floats that were were inspired by nursery rhymes from around the globe. There were also employees in costume uh, doing musical ensembles. There were clown costumes and there were even live animals in the beginning from the Central Park Zoo. So that was the basis of the parade. And then in 1927, we introduced the balloons. Uh, and obviously, you know, the balloons have grown over time. Uh, and as we celebrate our 95th anniversary this year, it, it's become a staple. The parade has occurred uh, every year, with the exception of three years during World War II, where we actually donated much of the material that you see in the parade that year to, to the war efforts. But other than that, the parade has, has gone on continuously uh, other than those three years. 
and it really is such like a pop culture icon here in America. It's I can't even imagine Thanksgiving without the parade. And even last year, through the insanity of last year, there was still a version of the parade. And honestly, for like for me, that was that was a question when we were going th- through all of this stuff. Like, oh, it, you know, how many of our traditions aren't going to exist? So when it was announced that there will be a version of it. It was like this slight relief. I know there were way more important things going on in the world, but like it's those touchstones throughout the year that make life feel normal and good. Yeah, I, I think it was important last year. And, and I and I think we all knew from day one that it might not be the parade that everyone was accustomed to, but we knew that that it was important to America to put on a parade. And um, the same thing happened in, in 2001 uh, with the attacks. We were able to have a parade in November that year, and it meant a lot to the country. And I think last year was no different. Uh, we were able to have a, a, a virtual telecast. Uh, the parade is never the same without our live spectators. This year, we are absolutely thrilled to return to normal, to have live spectators down the live uh down the parade route um but we were proud of what we accomplished last year and and i think we did deliver a telecast that that everyone was excited to see that that was able to feature many of the celebrity performers that they're accustomed to they were able to see the balloons that they look forward to every year and and as proud as we were uh about what we accomplished last year we're really thrilled to have that sense of normalcy as we look forward to this year's parade Excellent. Now, Jordan, this is a big question, but as a producer for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, what are your responsibilities? I'm sure there are many that we can't get to all of them, but like, what are your main core responsibilities? Yeah, I'd say my my primary responsibility is making sure that the parade represents pop culture and the characters that we feature and the brands that we feature are done in an entertaining way. And uh, And for us, um, we know that it's a it's a it's a cross generational audience. We know that uh, eight year olds are watching with their their parents and often watching with their grandparents. So anything that we deliver from an entertainment spectacle perspective needs to really hit home with with everybody that's watching. So when we look and evaluate balloon characters, we want to make sure that that it's something that resonates with with kids as well as adults. And same thing when we talk about our floats and our marching bands, we want to make sure that we deliver uh, something that that appeals to to a wide a wide audience uh, so it's my job when we look at floats balloons to make sure that we're really entertaining America in a variety of different ways that day very cool now today we are going to focus mostly on the giant character balloons that are part of the parade but before we jump specifically into the Disney balloons through the years I want to know more about the balloons as a whole now I think you mentioned this but how far back exactly does the tradition of oversized balloons go was it 1927 yes. Awesome. So, you know, it's been a part of the parade for a very, very, very long time. Was this an original concept to Macy's or did giant balloons like this exist before the use in the parade? Because honestly, I just think of Macy's when I think of these giant balloons. That's not a bad thing. We want you to think of Macy's when you think of balloons. But but yes, it was an original concept. It was uh, originated by the famed puppeteer who was also a Macy's window designer, Tony Sarg. Um, and he created them as upside down marionette puppets. So that's the history behind the balloons themselves. That's an awesome concept. I've never heard them described that way. Yeah. If you look at our elf or if you look at our ice cream cone, uh, you can see that they're inverted very often. So so um, obviously later we can get into the specifics of aerodynamics. But yes, they they are upside down puppets more often than not. That is very, very cool. Now, what is this design process like? And does it change, you know, when working with a company like Disney? Of course, they have kind of strict character integrity. What's that process like? Is it a Macy's person? Is it a Disney person? Yeah, it's a collaboration. And the, and the process, to be honest, is is the same for all of our partners. Because as you pointed out, character integrity is, is the utmost importance. And at the heart of what we do, we need to make sure that anyone that is looking at these inflatables instantly recognizes what that character is. And we're not doing our job properly if if we don't take the aerodynamics into consideration, but the character correctness into consideration. So it is it is a staple of what we do. It is a collaboration. Um, we work diligently to replicate that character's likeness. And at at the heart of it, it starts with quite often a pencil sketch. And that pencil sketch really takes into the flight position into account. It takes into the aerodynamics. And what we want is a balloon that's going to fly safely, but also look 
absolutely spectacular, not only for the live audience, for the television audience. So a lot goes into that initial pose, making sure that not only does it look right, um, but it will fly correctly as well. And once we work with our partner to iron out what that flat 2D piece of art looks like, then we move into a computer generated 3D model. We understand the, the aerodynamics, we understand the engineering behind it, the flight profile, and we work with our partner to approve what that 3D turnaround uh, computer simulated model looks like. So again, making sure that it's as character correct as possible, taking into some liberties for aerodynamics. And then once we have that uh, character nailed down, the final stage is looking at um, the technical aspects of it, where the inflation and deflation ports are. And that's really where we infuse helium into the balloons themselves, um, where the handling lines are so that it's properly balanced as the, as the uh, balloon handlers walk the balloon down the parade route. And the number of chambers and making sure the chambers are balanced Heaven forbid there be uh, an issue with the balloon. They're all the balloons are built in in separate chambers. So worst case scenario, if it should have a small puncture, the entire uh, balloon doesn't deflate. We just have one element or one portion of the balloon, and then obviously the the final part is sealing the balloon together. So so those are the various stages of how we get from concept creation to completed balloon uh, production. That's interesting. I didn't realize there were chambers, but that totally makes sense, right? <laughs> at least, at least it'll stay in the air and not fall on the crowd. Abs- <laughs> absolutely. Know? Again, safety is 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 the priority in everything that we do, but they are fragile and balloons are very complicated. And sadly, every once in a while, there might be a small puncture, and what we don't want is the entire balloon to deflate. So that's why they're built in chambers, so that in that rare instance, it's only one portion of the balloon rather than the entirety uh, that has a malfunction. What kind of stuff would puncture it in New York City? I mean, I just think of these balloons as having like really thick walls. I mean, almost everybody's been in a bounce house and we've all jumped on them and stuff. So like, what is sharp enough to really puncture it? Yeah, well, you know, to be honest, a lot goes into to the inflation of it. And, and they're inflated on New York City streets. And as much as we tarp those streets and we we clean those streets, you never know what could cross uh, in the air um, that day. Sometimes a branch might fall from a tree on a windy day. Other times in the inflation process, the, the balloon might uh, scrape the ground as it goes up. So, so again, we take great care in everything that we do. Uh, we have a team that is escorting the balloon down the line of march. We have a team overnight that is um, making sure that the inflation area is secure. Uh, if there is a puncture, we are there throughout the night making sure that, that the balloon is, is, is kept the way we expect it to. And we even have people that are painting overnight if if there is a scuff or something happens so that the balloon is what we call parade ready for showtime on Thanksgiving Day. That's awesome. And so you were talking about that, you know, starting as a pencil sketch going into the computer. Now, those are artists that Macy uh, hired or like in the case of Disney, would a Disney artist no, work on the, that? No, these are Macy's. We have, a, we have a Macy's parade studio with incredibly talented individuals. And um, all of that process is done by the, the artisans at Macy's. We work hand in hand with our partners to approve whatever it is that we're doing. But, but all of that artwork uh, is created by the Macy's parade studio. I'm going to assume that there's multiple artists, and I'm curious, do they, you know, I'm going to use the word fight for lack of a better term, but is there ever a fight over who gets what character? No, I, I don't think there's ever a fight. I, I think, you know, there are certain personalities that that tend to lean towards certain characters that that suit their, their personality well, but I, I'd say they're all incredibly skilled. Uh, they all have their preferences, but no matter what uh, character they're working on, we all know that they're going to get 110%. And uh, at the end of the day, I- I'd say they embrace whatever project they're working on. And I can't speak enough about the talent at the Parade Studio. They are they are just they're just truly amazing. And I think you're right. You know, you said it when you started out. Disney is is amongst everyone else. Obviously, is very. Um, particular about their characters, but but certainly Disney is uber protective. And anytime we work with Disney, we have a special eye on on the on the character that we're creating. And it's been an incredible process working with them. Whether we were talking about a float or whether we're talking about a balloon, it's been a truly magical process anytime we work with Disney. That's awesome. Now these balloons are obviously not you know flown for the first time day of parade. You actually have to test these. And where does that typically happen? Is that like done in, in a I mean, it's obviously massive. It has to go outdoors, I assume, to be tested. Yeah, there's a series of test flights, and it's actually a closely guarded secret. We don't really tell people where we test fly our balloons, but 
But to answer your question, the first test flight is done inside. Uh, we, we, we go to a dome where we can control the, the, the weather, quite frankly. We want to understand how the balloon's going to fly regardless of the conditions that day. So that's why it's flown in a, it's flown in a controlled environment. It enables us to, to see how it will fly and to add handling lines depending upon the nature of its flight. Uh, if it should be leaning towards one side, then we add handling lines to the other. So it's really, uh, it's done for engineering and to make sure that we understand the tendencies of the balloon to fly without the elements of, of wind. Then yes, we have a second public viewing uh, where we fly it outside. And that is done so that, again, we can test it and understand, again, what type of adjustments we need to make for those handling lines. So, so there's two, two test flights, one indoors, and then once we make adjustments to the balloon, then we do it again outdoors for a second time. Okay, so obviously there's like the plan A where the balloon flies exactly like you want on parade day. And then, you know, the worst situation is for some reason, whether it's weather or a puncture, it can't fly. How many plans are there in between that? I'm going to assume that, you know, if it's super windy, it's lower to the ground or, you know, how many different versions, I guess, could there be? Yeah, and and every balloon is flown under the guidance of our partners at the, at the city of New York. So every balloon has a series of of people that are well-trained, captains, pilots that fly the balloon. And they're, um, they, in conjunction with the, the representatives of the NYPD, fly each balloon. And uh, if, it's, if, if, a, if, a, if the conditions are, are excessively windy, then we fly it lower. And if it's a beautiful day, they can fly the balloons higher. And it's all done uh, in concert with, with that team, the pilots, the captains of the balloon, and, and obviously NYPD. What I love so much about it is obviously, you know, the balloons are massive, but so are the skyscrapers of New York City. Yet never once have I seen a Macy's balloon and been like, oh, that looks dwarfed. Like, <laughs> they look massive among skyscrapers. Like, it's, it's just such a cool tradition. I love it so much. Uh, now, you were talking about, you know, pencil to paper and now getting them in the air. How long is that process typically? It all depends upon the complexity of the character. I can tell you that that we're speaking here on the first week of November, and we're already talking to partners uh, and going through the creative process for next year's parade. So it is a lengthy process. But I'd say, you know, I'd say from the time the balloon is finalized, and again, you know, the creative process, depending on the partner, can be can be rather time consuming, and there's a lot of nuances that we have to make in that flight position, like we talked about. But I'd say once we finalize the design. And once it gets into production, that that time is from construction to its first flight is typically about four months. Um, okay. But it does take some time to go through the entirety of that creative process to make sure that 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 character is character correct to the specifications of our partners. Very cool. Now, what is this selection process like? Does Macy's reach out to companies and say, hey, would like you represented or your character represented in the parade? Or is it companies coming to Macy's and saying, hey, we got a movie we want to promote? I'm sure it's kind of a mix, maybe. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. It, it is a mix. We have our eyes on certain characters, absolutely. So we are always being proactive, trying to identify the best in pop culture, uh, some of the most classic characters in the world, something that appeals, like we said earlier, to, to just everybody in our audience. So we are certainly proactive in, in trying to keep our, our finger on the pulse of what would be engaging to our audience. Um, but you're right. There are times where there's a character that's celebrating a milestone anniversary, and that's the reason for them to be part of the parade. Or there's a character that's going to debut um, in a movie, and, and that's the rationale for wanting to be part of the parade. And really, the criterion for us is that it has to be an instantly recognizable character. Uh, that's where we start from. It has to be something that that no matter where you are in the world, someone would know who that character is. And if you look at all the Disney characters that we've highlighted over the years, you know, no matter where you are, everyone knows who Mickey Mouse is, who Buzz Lightyear is. So that is really where we start from and really trying to identify the best characters, the most engaging character, the most entertaining characters, because that's what we know our audience wants. And it's really not about putting products in the sky or corporate logos or or companies. It's it's really putting the best in family entertainment in the sky. It's interesting that you say you want to make sure that the character is recognized across the world because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume viewers are Americans, right? Or does this go across the world? It's an American holiday. So that was my assumption. Yeah, no, you're correct. Primarily the, the telecast and the live stream all is, is here in the States, but there's significant media coverage around the globe. 
Um, we have a lot of characters from anime, whether it be Goku or whether it be Sonic, whether it be Pokemon that are that are huge internationally. So so we get coverage that that's picked up around the globe. But in terms of our, our primary telecast, you're right. That is a domestic audience that is watching here. But there are parade fans around the world, similar to Disney, of course. Oh, very cool. Now, what is it like being a balloon handler? I mean, this is what's the training like for this? I actually looked into it once because I got to tell you, it's a just going to the parade is a bucket list item for me. I've I've never seen it live, but I will someday. But I I actually looked into being a balloon handler, and the only thing that really kept me from it was I live in Los Angeles, and like there were rehearsals in September and October and stuff, and I was like, I can't fly back and forth for this. So what's the process? Yeah, you're correct. I mean, again, you know, I can't stress the importance of safety and everything that we do in the parade itself. So there are several trainings for all of our balloon handlers, for all of our balloon captains, for all of our balloon pilots. It starts with with that. But what is it like? It's a ton of fun. I, I mean, in all honesty, you get to fly a beloved character in front of millions of spectators and viewers that are all cheering your character's name. The experience itself is really straightforward. You know, you're guiding the balloon with 90 other people. Uh, Your hands are attached to a a handling line and you're looking and you're listening to the directions of your your balloon pilot and balloon captain who are telling you that you'll have to walk a little slower. Um, They'll tell you that the right side of the balloon needs to move a little faster around a corner. They are in charge of monitoring the wind to make sure that that if we can raise the balloon on a quiet day, we're flying it as high as possible. And conversely, if they if they know that there's a gust of wind coming, they can they can certainly lower the balloon. So everyone is trained in advance. It's a mixture of video training and field training, but there's no better role on parade day in terms of interaction with the crowd. You know, people will absolutely chant your character's name for the entire three and a half mile parade route. And who are these people? Are, is it mostly Macy's employees? Or, I mean, I, I, like I said, I looked online and it kind of seemed like they were looking for just everyday people as well. Or is that still the case? Yeah, no. One of the wonderful traditions of the parade is, is that it was started by our employees. And that is something that is true to this day. Everyone that you see in the parade is an em- Macy's employee or is connected to a Macy's employee so that they're doing it with a Macy's employee. So if you're a Macy's employee, you can bring a friend, you can bring a family member. Um, but at the heart of it, it, it's a parade that is that was created by our employees. And that's something that is still true to this day, that the vast majority are Macy's employees doing it with their friends and family. Okay. Well, when the time comes, Jordan, you're my Macy's employee friend. I'm putting your name on the paperwork. <laughs> I might not be able to do it with you that day, but nothing would make me happier than to make sure one of my family members goes down a parade route with you. It's hard work from what I understand. I know a friend who did it at Universal who said, you know, it is heavy, but the thing that's so crazy about it is it's such an honor. And I say that thinking, I'm sure this has happened in many, many cases, but I remember seeing, you know, John Lasseter walking down carrying Olaf. And I'm like, you know, he's not the fittest guy in the world, yet it's still, it's such an honor to carry these balloons down the streets of New York that like even celebrities and people who really don't need to be doing this do it because it's it's amazing. You're correct. John Laster did it. He did it many years with his family. He did it under the radar. It wasn't a celebrity driven, send a chauffeur driven car. He, like everyone else, reported to to Macy's that morning, uh, went through the process of getting in costume, went on a bus uptown and, and did it like everybody else. And it is it is a lot of fun. Uh, you are, uh, you know, where else where else do you get the opportunity to have, you know, millions of people cheering you on. Obviously there, there are a couple events, but, but nothing like holding a balloon line. And, and to be honest, there's a lot that we do to make it as easy as possible. You know, as I mentioned, there's typically 90 other balloon handlers. So if you do get tired, we have the opportunity to switch you out with somebody else. So you're never put in a a position that you're in over your head uh, between your training and monitoring of the balloon. There's always someone that can help you out down the parade route. That's awesome. Now let's jump into some specific Disney balloons through the years. In 1934, this was the first Disney balloon. It was Mickey Mouse, of course. And this was, you know, the parade had started 10 years before. So it was the 10th anniversary of the Macy's Parade. And I have heard, correct me if I'm wrong or if you know, I've heard that this was the third pop culture figure to be made into a balloon. Do you happen to know if that's true and what the previous two might have been? I I can tell you definitely that the first character was Felix the Cat. That I do know. Felix the Cat was the first character. I believe that we had uh, Inspector Katzenjammer and Mrs. Katzenjammer. 
but don't quote me on that. And I know I'm supposed to know everything, uh, but that's, no, that's you're, good. you're going way back and deep into the Macy's archives <laughs> for this one. So I, I think Felix the cat was absolutely the first licensed character. And I'm pretty sure the cats and Jammer kids predated Mickey. Well, the thing that's really funny about that, as I said, 1934 was the year for Mickey. And it's like, well, what took 10 years for to get Mickey in there? But you got to remember 1924, when the parade started, the Walt Disney Company was spanking, you know, brand spanking new, right. you know. And so, you know, 10 years might sound like a long time, but it's like really ever since – Early on in the days of the Walt Disney Company, there's sort of been representation in, in the parade. It, it's been a great relationship. And, and as much as we would love to have Disney have a focus every single year, we are proud, certainly, of what we've accomplished through the years. You know, we've had several balloons. We've had several floats. We've had several character performances. So, so it has been a, a really fruitful relationship between it, uh, uh, our two respective organizations. Yeah, then the following year in 1935, we got Donald Duck in addition to Mickey Mouse, and Donald was a brand new character because Donald was quote-unquote born in 1934, and this was a Donald that's kind of unrecognizable to folks that know Donald Duck today. He had a very long neck, mm -hmm. and this is one of those situations where maybe not the best design for a balloon because he, he had a little trouble keeping his neck up. But this is, these are the things you learn through the years of flying balloons, right? You're absolutely. We've we, and, and maybe we'll talk about it a little, a little bit, but we have learned a lot working with the Disney characters. And like I said, you know, balloons like to be round and, and many of the Disney characters aren't exactly round. So, so we've learned a lot through the years. Um, but Certainly, Donald Duck wasn't an easy balloon, and and uh, but it was a, a stunning, great balloon, and we were proud to feature Donald. I, I don't think I realized that he was only two years old. Is that what you're saying? I think one year old. He was a new character because, yeah, Donald was born in 34, and it was in the parade in 35. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's so awesome that in its second year, we were able to feature Donald. That's a great, great pre uh, bit of trivia that I wasn't even privy to myself. Yeah. Then Donald would return in 1962 with a second balloon that looked very much like the one we know and love today. Correct. So – the problems were fixed and uh, and definitely more familiar. It's amazing how different these characters change through the years. Like every yeah. generation, ha you know, it's the same character, but we all kind of have our own version. I even think of that going to the, par the parks today. I'm like, that's not exactly the Mickey I grew up with, but it's still Mickey. Yeah, they they evolve absolutely, but um, you know that that's part of that, that's part of what makes the character precious is that evolution over time. You know, they're they're still classic, but there's little tweaks that that you notice from you know over the over the over time. Do you happen to know with the early Mickey balloon, that first one, was – I've only seen black and white photos of it. Do you happen to know, was the balloon black and white, kind of like a steamboat uh, willy sort of situation, or was it actually color with the black and white photo? I've only seen black and white. So so that's my understanding. Again, you know, we're going way back in our archives uh, when we talk about something that long ago. But I, I don't think it was colorized. I, I think it was black and white. All right. Well, we get a brand new Mickey balloon in 1972. This was for the opening of Walt Disney World. Now, of course, this was supposed to take place in 1971. But this is one of those years where the wind just was not playing nice, unfortunately. It's extremely rare that that winds ground our balloons uh but certainly that was a year uh and and obviously you know it, it you know the, the the mickey balloon came back the following year in 72 like you said yeah now it, it, it's funny because the there have been so many balloons through the years but of course there's the ones that just stick out in your mind as a kid and santa goofy from 1992 this is one that and it's crazy i think it only appeared one year in the parade yeah. It, again, it's rare for us to have a balloon that doesn't fly for multiple years, but but uh, that that's that's correct as far as I understand as well. It was just a one year appearance for for Santa Goofy. Is is it true? I've heard this. I have no idea if this is true. Did they used to release the balloons like back way in the early days? Yeah, way in the early days we did. It was it was a Macy's driver. There was a a postcard at at attached to the balloon, and uh, if you returned the balloon uh, from wherever you found it to a Macy's, you got a gift card. So so obviously we can't even contemplate doing that today. But that was one of those original <laughs> things that we did back in the day. That was. That was fun back then uh, that makes you roll your eyes when we think about it in, in modern society today. 
Yeah, there's so many things with that. Number one, like, just the dangerous aspect of it, but also, like, the cost. These balloons are not cheap. So, I'm, and listen, I'm sure they were much smaller back then. Yes. That, that's kind of amazing. Can you imagine, like, oh, a Macy's balloon landed on my front lawn? <laughs> right. And you're right. I think the scale of what we did back then versus today is totally different. But – um but it, it was something that 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 happened for several years. That's awesome. Now back to that Santa Goofy balloon that I know and love. This was super cool because this balloon, along with some others, would go on to appear at Disney MGM Studios, now Disney's Hollywood Studios, for what they called the Macy's New York Christmas. This would take place on the streets of America, which was like the New York City backlot area of the park. So obviously the perfect setting for this. Now this is kind of cool because it's very, very rare for these balloons to appear outside of the Macy's parade, especially these big character balloons. This was actually the second time in history that it happened because in 1979, the Kermit balloon, Kermit the Frog, was shipped to England to celebrate International Year of the Child. And so this Disney MGM Studios appearance would be only the second time that this happened. And Kermit actually was part of it as well, as well as the Santa Goofy. And Betty Boop, which I find kind of interesting, considering it has, you know, no Disney connection, really. And uh, a lot of, like, the Macy stars and classic things. And I've only seen photos of this, but... I wish that this was a tradition for a long time. This seems like such a cool concept and idea. Yeah. You know, to be honest, Jeff, it's it's rare that we fly, like you mentioned, balloons outside the parade. It happens on occasion, but but we view this really as, as kind of like your Christmas ornaments. If the balloons were out there year round, they wouldn't feel as special as they are. So, so if we do bring it out, like you mentioned, it has to be a really significant, worthwhile, publicity-oriented event. Um, we don't bring it out just for the sake of bringing it out. It is something that we want to be special um, outside of the parade day. In relation to that theme park appearance, uh, it's worth mentioning that the balloons are now part of Universal's holiday parade featuring Macy's. Uh, This started in 2002 under a different name, but for a long time, uh, a good number of the balloons have been flown down to Universal Studios Florida and become part of their holiday event there, which is really cool. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly, you know, it, that, that parade has changed over the years. And and just for our listeners to, to understand, you know, we would only feature our smaller balloons within that parade itself. There is no way with the size and scale of our, our current giant character balloons, we could fly it in the streets of, of a theme park uh, anymore. So we do, we do, um, we have brought smaller inflatables to that parade, um, but certainly not the large scale inflatables um, that, that we're accustomed to seeing in present day. Now, has there ever been a situation where like Universal, I'm just saying, for example, you know, Shrek is represented in that theme park. Are they ever like, okay, we want a Shrek balloon, so let's design a smaller one for New York so that it's able to come to Florida? Yeah, a lot of what you see at that Universal Orlando Resort um, parade is smaller characters uh, that haven't appeared in the parade that, that are intrinsic to that parade. So you will see some of the characters from Madagascar, as well as some of their other uh, IP uh, represented in that parade through the inflatable program. Gotcha. So these are balloons kind of uh, in a lot of cases specifically for the park and not necessarily seen in New York. 100%. They are specifically designed for that parade given the scale of that parade route. So that is why we can't replicate the, you know, the giant helium balloons from our parade and their parade, uh, so to speak. That's awesome. I I love that. That's another one I got to check out some year uh, just because I love these balloons. I'm a nerd. They're great. They are. They are beautiful. They're smaller, but they're just as precise in terms of their design and the specifications of the character. Yeah, I guess if you were to do the huge ones, I mean, 90 people per balloon, that would get quite costly for uh, universal team members. (laughs) Yeah. Forget the cost. Just, you know, the the streets of a theme park are not like our wide New York City streets. They literally would probably be you know, wall to wall filling the street, let alone flying them. So scale wise, um, we're not able to do it. There were years, to be honest, where we did inflate them stationary at Universal so that people could understand the size and the scale of those balloons. They were they were tethered down so you could see them fully inflated, but they were never flown uh, given their size. Gotcha. All right, let's head back to Disney stuff. We got in the year 2000 for the new millennium band leader, Mickey. This was the first balloon in the parade that year, I believe. Yeah, led the parade. Yeah, and the classic Mickey Mouse Club uniform. What would, do you know, the 
choice why that choice was made like new millennium mickey mouse first in the parade obviously he's classic but was there anything else behind that that you know of i don't know jeff i'd say i've been around for a really long time that was the year before i started the parade so anything from 2001 grill me on but anything pre-2001 you're you're going back wow so you've been doing it for 20 years nearly 20 years yeah i've been part of this team for nearly 20 years that's awesome so is it like a year round producing gig for you? It is. It it is a year round, you know, like we said, the balloons take over a year to build and to to maintain those relationships with the studios and the brands that are represented. It's a full time job. Macy's here also obviously has the Macy's Fourth of July fireworks spectacular. Uh, our team also produces uh, all of the all of the holiday attractions across the country, such as Macy's Santaland. In the spring, we do a, a flower show. So the parade is by far the biggest thing that we work on year round, but our team is in charge of the brand love for Macy's and making sure that that anyone um, has that connection to Macy's through our iconic events. That's so cool. Now, in 2004, we got Chicken Little, and this was actually a full year before the movie was released. And, you know, sometimes they bring out these character balloons to promote a new movie, but it's crazy to think like a whole year in advance. It's, you know, that's how much of a draw this parade has and how conscious people of are of it, you know? Yeah, it was an honor. Like I said, you know, to debut a, a character from a movie before anyone else has seen it is certainly an honor for us and, and, and a rarity. And I think we talked about what we've learned. You know, that was one of those cases where we've never produce glasses such as uh, such as chicken little's glasses and there was a lot of technology that went into the framework of how can we how can we construct his glasses so it was a really fun process there was a lot of learning that went on with that balloon but but to be able to debut the character before anyone else really was familiar with it was was novel for us and something that we thought was really worthwhile doing that's awesome then in 2008 a character that people certainly knew already but certainly loved that is buzz lightyear and this was a huge balloon, and I can say that for certain because I actually saw this one in person. This was one of the few instances where the balloon left New York, went to the D23 Expo in 2015 in Anaheim, California, and this was such a cool thing. I don't think this was anything that like they announced was coming to the Expo, but I'll tell you, it made quite an impression when you were you know, heading toward the convention center. Yeah, again, you know, it's rare that we get to fly our balloons outside of New York City. So I'd like to think it must have been amazing to see it in California. Uh, it's nice to have nice weather. We we're guaranteed pretty much decent weather as well. But again, it's another one of those balloons that that pushed technology for us to, to come up with this clear helmet was something we've never done before and was something that was really a challenge that that was at the end of the day really spectacular when you saw it in person. Yeah, he was in the parade for a long time. He, Yeah, I don't know how many years, but certainly I, I feel like it was, you know, over five years off the top of my head. Well, they kept making the movies. So, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very cool. In 2009, we got Sailor Mickey to promote Disney Cruise Line. And this was a very cool balloon. But I want to tie that into this year because you've mentioned several times that not only are there Disney balloons, but there are also Disney floats that have taken place in the parade through the years. And this year, uh, there's a new float for the parade called Magic Meets the Sea. Now, this float is designed after the new Disney Wish cruise ship setting sail this summer, and aboard will be characters related to the cruise ship, including Captain Minnie Mouse, Princess Tiana, Aladdin and Jasmine, Cinderella, and more. What else can you tell us about this new float? Of course, nobody's seen it yet. Is and, uh, is there going to be a related balloon paired with it by any chance? There's no related balloon, but this is going to be a spectacular moment within the parade. We have worked with the Disney team to replicate a DCL ship, but really it's going to serve as the bit. Not only is that float spectacular, it's going to serve as the basis for this wonderful cast performance with many, with many other characters that you named. And some surprise characters that we're not ready to reveal just yet, but it's it's going to be a wonderful cast performance. And the backdrop to that cast performance is this Disney Cruise Line ship that is similar to our balloons done to precise specifications so that you will instantly recognize that this is a DCL ship. Very cool. And like I said, this relationship with Disney Cruise Line goes back to 2009 with that uh, original Sailor Mickey balloon. So. Yeah, you're, you're correct. When we designed that ship, it was really all about uh, Sailor Mickey and he flew on his anchor with his sailor cap. So it was all you know done to promote the sailing aspect of, uh, of Mickey. 
I, I do have a failing. Of course, you do not need to confirm or deny here, but I'm just saying there's a lot of Marvel stuff coming to the Disney Wish, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of Marvel. And uh, speaking of Marvel, I do want to say, since Disney owns them now, Spider-Man has been in the parade since long before Disney owned them, back in 1987. And this one always looked so big to me. I don't Do you know what the biggest balloon is? ever has been i don't know but i i think what made that balloon so special was his flight position and it was yes. just spectacular and stunning and just so you know so so right in front of you i think it's one of those amazing balloons that that quite frankly when people you know i think like you said it made such an impression often when we ask people or when you hear what's your favorite balloon that's flying this year they they say spider-man despite it not flying for 10 years it just it has that type of of lasting memory to to our fans so it, it really was a beautiful, fun balloon, but it's all because of that flight position. Yeah, you're right. I, I never really thought of it that way. But that, I guess that's probably a thing that part of the, you know, the process of designing, there must be a, a bunch of different positions that these things are drawn in. And then obviously one is ultimately selected. Yeah, we, we, we try a lot of different things out. Um, you know, as I explained before, you know, you know, flight position is critical, but ultimately we need to make sure it flies safely. So um, there are some crazy designs that we work on and our engineering comes back and says, there's no way that we could ever do it um, in that position. And, and I think a lot of what you saw in our history were vertically flying balloons, but that is not something that you'll see in our parade anymore. You know, if you look back in, in our archives, you'll see a lot of balloons that are just static, standing straight in the sky. You know, now there's certainly more horizontal uh, for wind more than anything else. Yeah. In 2017, uh, that was the newest Disney balloon. We got Olaf to promote Olaf's Frozen Adventure. And that's the one, like we mentioned before, that John Lasseter actually carried down the street on some years. And yeah, so that was the the latest Disney balloon. And this year we get a, a brand new float. Yeah. And, and like I said, you know, the nice thing about Olaf, considering some of the predecessors and complexity, Olaf is made for flying. That was a beautiful character. If you have to create an inflatable, that's kind of where you want to start with an Olaf looking design. So that, that was nice for a change. The simplicity of Olaf is what made that balloon so special. Now, do you happen to know if Josh Gad ever carried the balloon? I don't believe he has. I'm, I'm honestly surprised by that. I think he lives in New York. I think there were absolutely conversations, as I recall, about him possibly wanting to do it. But to the best of my knowledge, that never came to fruition. Excellent. Well, that was kind of a, an overview of the Disney balloons through the years. I am curious, though, do you have a particular favorite Disney balloon or piece of the parade from through the years? Yeah, I, I think it, we talked about it briefly, Chicken Little. I, I think it was one of the first things that I worked on, you know, in a significant way when I worked here at Macy's with Disney. So I think that was one of the first Disney characters that I worked on. And again, it was pushing the envelope in terms of technology and how we create our inflatables and doing something that we've never done with his glasses. And, and, I, and I think, A, just the notion of, of being able to debut a character uh, from the Disney franchise that hadn't been seen widely beforehand was something that was an honor, like we've said before. So, so I think that would be you know my favorite Disney balloon uh, only because of the personal connection to it. Very cool. Now, is there a particular Disney character that you'd like to see turned into a balloon that hasn't been yet? The answer is, of course, you know, um, there's where do you even start when you think about the legacy characters and the new characters behind Disney? I, I think I said it when we started. I, I am I'm a Disney fan, you know, so, you know, what I would choose might not be what mainstream would choose. But but for me, oh, I'm excited for this. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know, I got, I, you know, a little a little Jordan Dabby personal connection to, to Disney. Uh we got engaged, me and my wife at Disney, and I presented, you know, um, a, a plush of Kanga and Rue to my wife when we got engaged and the ring was on on Rue's finger. So I, I think solely for the personal connection of what Kanga and Rue means to my family, nice to have both of them as an inflatable. So that would be a lot of fun for me. But, you know, again, you know, a classic character like Minnie Mouse would be wonderful. I, I think, you know, Princess Jasmine, you know, she's beautiful. She would fly beautifully. Or, you know, I, I don't think we can say, if you look at the, the newer Disney properties, I don't think you can say Finding Nemo is a, a new property by any means, but compared to many, it certainly is. I think having a Dory balloon would be just special as well, just so different than anything else we have in the parade. So I don't think you can go wrong with any of those, but but yeah, I'd say personally, I'm going with a sleeper one in Kangaroo, something little known probably compared to the masses of Disney. 
I don't think there's ever been a Peter Pan. I always loved the connection. Like, I loved Buzz Lightyear because, you know, he kind of flies or falls, at least, in the film. Uh, so I always love it, like, when the character actually flies. No Tinkerbell either, I don't think. Yeah, Jeff, when, you were, when I was thinking about that question, actually, you know, for some reason, I went to Tinkerbell before Peter Pan. I don't, I don't know why, but for the same reason, I, you know, Tinkerbell was certainly on, on you know, the, the list when, when I was thinking about um, how to answer that question. Yeah. Now, do you know if there were any Disney balloon concepts that were pitched that just didn't come to fruition for one reason or another? Not to my knowledge. I think, you know, the only thing I'd say is through the creative process, there were probably a lot of different things that couldn't pan out from an engineering or aerodynamic perspective. But through that collaborative process, you know, if if we have a, you know, Disney has always been a wonderful partner, incredibly creative teams. And I think, you know, we just need a nugget of an idea and with their partner's help, with Disney's help, we've been able to, to bring to life any of the characters that they wanted to put in the parade. So I don't I don't think there was one that that was a concept that didn't come to fruition. It was just tweaking perhaps what that original concept was to make sure that it was translated in a way that would be uh, uh, appropriate for the parade itself. Going back to Chicken Little for a second, I'm curious just because of something you said earlier where you, you know, you really seek out characters that are immediately recognizable. And of course, the the concept of introducing a character is a super exciting one. But was that kind of a hard sell or a hard pitch considering it certainly wasn't a recognizable character? It was certainly a pitch, to be honest. But I think, you know, Disney is a known entity, obviously, and and it's a known franchise. And they had, you know, they had big plans for the movie itself. So I think when when we were um, enlightened about what the plans were for that movie and that property, it was, and and obviously the trusted name of Disney behind it. I I think it was certainly something that took a little bit to digest, but I wouldn't say that we weren't confident that it was going to be a successful balloon or a successful movie for Disney. So, so to answer your question, yeah, it took a little bit of convincing, but I, I think, you know, the, the beauty of Disney is, is, you know, it's an incredibly creative team with wonderful ideas and and we were we were quickly convinced that it was right for the sky that's very cool now do you happen to know was that something that disney pitched to macy's or was that more like yeah no that was a that was a disney idea and and like i said we weren't all that familiar you know with the 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 with the property itself but they walked us through the game plan and what they were planning on for the movie um and and there was certainly something convincing in in that process and the character is an adorable looking character on top of it you know even if it wasn't at the time recognizable to most people i think it's a character that certainly when you look at you kind of smiled and could relate to so so aesthetically it was a beautiful character as well I want to start seeing in the future when these balloons are retired. I want you guys to start selling swatches of them. <laughs> you know, like when the electrical parade ended, well, quote unquote, ended for a, the millionth time. They sold the bulbs. At <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you say that because the reality of a balloon is is that at some point it, it is no longer flyable. That that's just the reality of of, of the balloons themselves. And when they are no longer able to fly, we do in our office create little swatches of the balloon that we use as pieces of art. So you're on to something there. Um, we have not ever sold them. We have not ever publicized that. But at some point, you know, we, we do have uh, in our archives swatches of, of all of our balloons once they're no longer flyable. That's so cool. There could so be a, like a museum all about this or yeah. a corner of a Macy's store or something. I don't know. I love it. Yeah, there's little pieces, you know, uh, again, if you get, you know, just the right spot of Snoopy, you know exactly what that character is. And 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 it's, you know, it's it's special. And it is a piece of art. Like we've said, we, we view it as a piece of art. Very cool. Now, before I let you go, I want to talk about one other thing. And that is the tradition of seeing the balloons being inflated, which I believe happens in Central Park in New York City. And this used to be one of those things that like, I'd kind of hear people talk about like, oh, if you really want to see the balloons, make sure you go to Central Park. And it was kind of this secret, but now it seems to have become an event in and of itself. You, you kind of nailed it. it. It had been a secret. Uh, it no longer is a secret. It, it's an event that kind of grew beginning in the 70s. And and we inflate our balloons the night before the parade uh, between you know Central Park West and Columbus. So not in Central Park, but adjacent to Central Park. Uh, we fill up those two avenues, 77th and 81st streets with all of the balloons in the parade. So it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to see a balloon inflate right in front of your, your very eyes. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to see the character fully inflated if you're not able to make it on parade day. 
it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of people that attend. Uh, I've heard, depending upon a year, over a million people attend inflation. So, so my recommendation is to always go early versus late in the evening. But it's it's a wonderful night in New York City. Everyone is festive. Everyone is celebrating. Everyone is gearing up for the Thanksgiving Day holiday. And obviously, many of those people return the next day to actually see the parade in person. But if for some reason you you can't spend Thanksgiving in New York City, I would recommend checking out Inflation Eve. It's a wonderful event um, where you get to see all the balloons in the parade. And that must be quite a sight to see them like all there next to each other, you know, not one at a time, but like this whole mass of inflated balloons. Yeah, they're, they're, they fill up two city avenues. Uh, when you line them up head to toe and you take all of our our giant character balloons. Uh, and then we have numerous other smaller inflatables as well. It, it fills up those two city blocks and it, and it is a sight to be seen. I think that's your first glimpse of understanding the size and scale of these balloons because you, unlike on parade day, you're literally, you know, 20 feet from the finger of a balloon, which will be three times, four times, five times the size of, of, of yourself. So, so it's a great opportunity to actually see it up close. That's so cool. Is it still helium that's used these days? Yeah, uh, it, it is primarily helium. There, there are certain times when we talk about chambers where it's a mix of helium and air, just so we can get the right balance in, in any in any given balloon. But yes, we we use helium and a mixture of air and helium in every balloon. Well, listen, I love this tradition. Thank you so much for coming on the show to talk a bit about it. And uh, I guess final question: When do you eat your turkey dinner? There is this wonderful parade tradition that we have uh, where um, many of our staff uh, at the parade studio um, works 48 straight hours, more or less, with 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 few breaks. So by the time Thanksgiving is over for them and, and they deflate their balloons and they pack up the floats, they get home, they pass out. We all celebrate on Friday together as a team. We bring our families and we have our Thanksgiving as a as a team together on, on Friday afternoon. So so that's a wonderful tradition where we get to celebrate what we've accomplished the day before. So so um, Friday afternoon is when I really enjoy uh, my Thanksgiving meal. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to celebrate with my family on Thursday, but there's many others that really look forward to Friday as a, a Macy's Parade tradition. That's fantastic. Between the Broadway shows, the balloons, the floats, the celebrities, it's it's an awesome tradition. So thank you for all the hard work you put into it and everybody you work with. And uh, thanks again for coming on the show. This has been a really fun conversation. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate you having me on. And, and I hope you and all of our listeners have an awesome uh, Thanksgiving holiday. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation about the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and I hope that you all tune into the broadcast, as I certainly will, or if you're really lucky, hit the streets of NYC and see it in person. Speaking of parades, parades are certainly a big part of the Disney Parks experience, and it's where my next guest started his varied Disney career. As he says, Tim O'Day started as a Disney, quote, parade kid, and has gone on to various other roles within the company. His latest is as one of the authors of the new book, A Portrait of Walt Disney World, 50 Years of the Most Magical Place on Earth. Listen as I chat with Tim about the experience of writing this fantastic book. Hello, Tim, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Happy to have you here today. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. Now, Tim, the book, A Portrait of Walt Disney World, 50 Years of the Most Magical Place on Earth, is truly fantastic. I loved it, but I am curious, how did you get involved with the writing of this book? What is your history with the Walt Disney Company, kind of in general? (laughs) I know, many years, many different hats, right? You had to wear that. You had to ask that one. As a matter of fact, it is 45 years ago this month that I started um, as a parade kid. Uh, at Disneyland many, 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 many years ago. And then through the years, just worked my way up through the company. I've worked and held many leadership positions, uh, Disneyland, uh, WDI in uh, PR at WDI, uh, Disney Consumer Products, Disney Interactive, Disney Online. And then, of course, as, a, as an author with Disney Publishing uh, and now uh, having a few um, Disney business units as clients. And uh, so it's been a long, long, fruitful relationship. It's been great. So how did you get involved with this book? Was this something that you kind of were interested in and contacted them? Or did they think of you for this? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that having had such a long history with with Disney, I've worked with God knows how many of the legendary Imagineers through the years. And I was fortunate to 
actually work on behalf of WDI, the, the press event for Walt Disney World's 20th anniversary. And then later on from a consumer product standpoint for Walt Disney World's 25th. And those were momentous occasions. And having also been um, one of the creative leaders of Disneyland's 50th, knowing that Disney World was coming up, it's like, what, what, what can I do that would be fun to, to help celebrate the 50th? And I thought, well, maybe a book. Well, on, on the same track, was Kevin Kern and Stephen Vagnini. They were thinking about it. And we happened to be working uh, a Disney Vacation Club cruise and we all happened to be on the on the ship. And um, one of the executives from Disney Publishing happened to be on there. And the three of us were talking about it. It's like, you want to do a book and you want to do a book and you want to do a book. So we said, well, let's go You know, talk to the executive editor. And we did. And, and that was back in goodness. That was, I want to say somewhere between 2013 and 2017, somewhere there. Wow. And so this book has been talked about for about eight years. And uh, that's how it came about. It was kind of serendipity. So since there were multiple authors on the book, what were the elements of the book that you were personally responsible for? Well, you know, we don't like to point out, like, you did this and you did this and you did this, because it really was, and I hate to say this because it sounds so cliché, but it really was a team effort. So we all took chapters that, you know, we had interest in. And uh, so we would write those individually. And then we, we would hand those off to each other and we would edit each other. And so the three of us can go through the book and go, okay, you wrote those two sentences, but I added this and that and all that. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, the nostalgia section was one of the sections assigned to me. We, we all had different sections to your point, but we all cross edited each other. So you really can't say this this one author did this because you know we, we, we poked and prodded everybody's work and it really became an amalgam of one, you know, one voice, if you will. Yeah, now with such a huge variety, and I mean huge variety of topics to choose from, how did the writing team choose which pieces to include in the book? Because I'm sure there are many that were cut, many that you know could have been included that weren't. How did you even start that process of dwindling it down to however many pages you had to write? Yeah, so we had 340 pages to write. That also includes endnotes, lots and lots and lots of endnotes. And Kevin, I have to give Kevin credit. He was the one that really wanted the endnotes. And so as the endnotes started getting bigger, I kept thinking to myself, we're losing more real estate in the book. However, I'm, I'm so happy that we did the endnotes because it really gives the book credibility. You know, it really shows that we did our research. Now, to your question, we started writing the book before we even started looking for photographs. We, we had you know, artwork and photographs you know, in our minds of what we might want, but we just kind of just laid it all out and just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and then realized, oh my, we need room for photographs. So then we had to kind of pull back. That's where it got hard, to your point. That's where it got hard to kind of, all right, what do you take out? What do you leave on the cutting room floor and all of that? But that's where the end notes came in too. So if I was not, let's say, uh, able to elaborate on, on a hotel concept that maybe was under consideration in the 70s, we could elaborate more on that in the end notes. So we didn't leave too much on the cutting room floor. I would say we, we got most of the information in there that we wanted. It was really imagery, photographs, and artwork that you know had to get cut just because there's just, you know a set number of pages you have to you have to work with. So uh, some of those were painful, but you know we did it. It was it was something though. it was it, that was a very funny moment to be honest with you, Jeff, that you know we were all kind of proud that, hey, we've got the writing done. And our editor said, okay, but there's no room for pictures now, you know. So uh, so that was a tough one on that day. It's like, <laughs> okay, now we've got a cut and and we have to make some very uh, serious cuts to make it all work. but you know, you, you can you can move text around and, and put in heavy captions. Again, we had the luxury of the end notes and things like that. So it all worked out. I loved how much the book highlighted the importance of Roy O. Disney, of course, Walt's brother. Was there anything that you learned about Roy during the writing of this book that you didn't previously know? Yes. I didn't know to the extent of, of uh, his involvement with the Imagineers. Uh, yeah, of course, he's leading the project. We all knew that. Um 
and also didn't realize how old he was. He was 78 years old when he passed away in December of uh, 1971. The other thing I didn't realize was how much older Edna was. When when, uh, Roy passed away in 71, Edna was uh, 81, I believe. So there was kind of a a larger uh, age gap there. So I I didn't realize that either. But the fact that he was so hands-on and it seemed like, you know, through our research, and I think it comes across in the book, that he was having the time of his life. Uh, and you see that in the photographs where he's walking through the machine shops and, the, you know, things like that. And, and he's looking at figures and architectural renderings and such. He just looks like he's a kid in a candy store. But think about it. He was always the finance guy. He was always the operations head. He was always the back end. And now he's kind of out in the forefront. He's not making necessarily creative decisions, but he's working in and amongst, really for the first time, the the creative team. And he just looks like he's having a blast, you know? And the confidence, that's the other thing that that caught my attention, was the confidence of this this man, that this is the largest construction project. It's enormous. And the pressure he must have had on his shoulders to open this thing on time, open it, finished, more or less. I mean, I, I wouldn't have slept. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know how you would react, but you know, I'd probably be a nervous wreck. And I mean, you see him on opening day, and he's just he's just kind of relaxed and like everything's fine and everything's great. And it's it's really remarkable. He must have honestly learned a lot about his brother, Walt, during that time, too, because I'm sure he was like, as you said, having the time of his life. And he was like, now I get why Walt loved this so much, (laughs) you know, because like you said, he was just dealing with so much of the finance stuff beforehand. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It must have opened his eyes to a lot of like what Walt had to deal with. Well, I think also, you know, they they had at that point 10, 15 years of Disneyland behind them. Mm-hmm. So, so I think he had the confidence coming from that, but Hey, we know how to do this. So yeah, I think that helped tremendously. Yeah. Now, one of the things that anybody who studied a bit of Disney history knows is that Epcot, the theme park, uh, the one that we got wasn't the dream of Epcot that Walt Disney had. But what a lot of people might not understand is that a lot of the dreams that Walt Disney had about Epcot in relation to creating and testing technology to create a better place to live is found in parts of Walt Disney World. And this book does a nice job highlighting some of those elements. Can you just talk a little bit about what elements of Walt's dream do exist at Walt Disney World? Well, the easiest ones to cite, of course, are the transportation systems, uh, particularly the monorail and the people mover. That's that's for sure. You can see those in the early plans of, of Epcot, the city. So that's an easy one. The one that's kind of below ground, if you will, literally, um, was the original DAX system that automated virtually everything in, in the Magic Kingdom that I'm sure was going to be a big part of, of Epcot, the city. And of course, the Utilidors and all of that. But then going forward now into the future, you know, there's there's a wonderful new uh, solar facility at Walt Disney World in the shape of Mickey, I might add, you know, that that's generating enough power, clean power to to power two of the four theme parks, you know, so so the the innovation just keeps going on. And it and it dovetails on a, on a point I wanted to make earlier is that, you know, the uh, the story of Walt Disney World. That was one of the the toughest things for us was the story of Walt Disney World is not over. Now that they fit 50 years, it keeps going. And so that's why we called it a portrait of Walt Disney World, because it's a snapshot in time of the first 50 years. But, you know, as soon as the book is written, something new has already opened, Uh, you know, a new resort hotel, a new attraction, a new area, a new this. So it's, it's an ongoing story. And so, uh, so that's why we came up with the name A Portrait Of, because the, the story doesn't end. Yeah, that's nice. Now, when putting this book together, was most of the information found through archival research, or were there a lot of new interviews conducted for the book? Well, I've got to say that the, the interviews were a, a lot of uh, a lot of the fun we had on the book. You know, we, we had the good fortune of starting the book before the pandemic struck, so we were able to meet on some occasions on a few occasions with uh, people in person, and then of course afterwards on Zoom. 
So we, we had the good fortune of meeting with Dick Nunes, you know, Mr. Mr. Disney legend himself. And Dick was terrific. He was, he was just fantastic. And, you know, he's, he's an old boss of mine. And I used to work with Dick on press events and things. And so, um, so he was, he was terrific um, contributing an essay, as did Debbie Dane Brown, the first ambassador, and as uh, Roy Patrick Disney did, because he was there on opening day with his father and grandfather. So he had some great stories. But, you know, we also talked to um, a diversity of people. You know, people we haven't heard from before. And that, that was one of the things we really wanted to do. We, we wanted to give it a real nice diversity of voices. And um, so we talked to Denise Hahn, Don Hahn's wife, who was one of the opening year tour guides at Walt Disney World. And she actually coordinated for us a Zoom call with many of the original tour guides from Walt Disney World. So we were able to talk to, to many of them. So, uh, so that was fun. Um, a name that is not easily recognizable is Sandy Quinn. Sandy worked uh, at the Preview Center. He worked in the public relations area. He helped open and staff and operate the Preview Center. And many, many, many years later, uh, after, after having worked in the Nixon administration, became responsible for opening the Nixon Presidential Library. And so Sandy had some great voice, uh, stories we hadn't heard before. And then um, uh, Bob Foster, of course, you know, Bob Foster, who, who had the job of finding the land, kind of you know, under the radar. And Kevin and Stephen had talked to, to Bob a few years earlier. So we were able to use that interview. And then Peggy Ferris, who um, just retired from Disney, longtime Disney Imagineer, uh, she had some wonderful stories too. So we were able to do new interviews with many, many, many new people. And as you can see through the book, the book is kind of led by these kind of call out quotes throughout the book. So we wanted as many voices as possible to tell the Walt Disney World story. And, uh, and we were very happy to do that, either by Zoom or in person, as you say. That's awesome that there's so much new content in there uh, because, you know, new is always uh, more interesting than something you've read before. So it wasn't just like picking through the archives, you know? That's one of the goals we had. You know, if you're a Disney fan, you're familiar with the Walt Disney World story. So, you know, what, what kind of new spin can we bring to it? What, what new angle can we bring to it? And I think one of those uh, angles is at the very beginning of the book is that, you know, Disney, quote unquote, predates Walt Disney World in Florida. The Disney family uh, has, has their roots in Florida uh, or some roots in Florida. So, um, so we were trying to approach these things, you know, in a different way. So it would seem fresh. Nice. Now, you mentioned earlier all of the amazing photos and graphics from around Walt Disney World and the book. Many of them I'd never seen before. So how did you go about finding these? Was this something where you were kind of leafing through stuff in archives or were the archives people like got your book and selected stuff for you? How did that work? Well, having worked on the book for so long and had it kind of rolling around in our heads for so long, we, we kind of knew what we were looking for in most cases. So... Um, you know, and having all of us having long experiences working for the company, we kind of knew where some of these things were. And so we'd reach out to the libraries and say, do you have this on an online database? Do you have this on an online database? And so um, the folks that work in the photo libraries and the, the art libraries were, were terrific. And in some instances, they would say, you know, that's, that's a good piece of artwork you pick there, but we've got a better one. And so it was a very, very collaborative uh, process. And uh, same with same with the photos, we were we were eager not to show kind of the same you know, photos and portraits that you've seen before. Let, let's say like uh, an example of Roy sitting on the bench with the characters. That's an alternate shot to the the shot we you know typically see. So they were extremely helpful. You know, thank goodness though that a vast majority of pieces of art and photography are online. And also the fact that we were, were starting the book before the pandemic struck. So that was very helpful. Yeah, there's an image of Sunny Eclipse in there that I really, really like. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, to that point, knowing, you know, ha knowing the fans and having our thumbs on the pulse of the fan community, we just knew that there were certain things that had to be in the book. And, and for me, uh, two of them was uh, Richard Girth, the greeter at the Grand Floridian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody remembers from their vacations and and auntie at uh, at the Polynesian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, putting in two beloved cast members who sadly are no longer with us, but people remember over the decades of, of meeting them. Yeah. So, yeah, we wanted to make sure that we hit those touch points. 
Nice. Now, this book has a section featuring different Walt Disney World anniversary celebrations throughout the years, but aside from it simply being a larger number, what makes this 50th anniversary stand out above the rest for you? Well, because it's a 50th anniversary. I mean, when, when you hit 50, it means you've arrived. You know, you, <laughs> you, are, you, are, now, you are now part of the pop culture if, if you're a destination or, or a, a, you know, a, a vacation destination or... or you know, piece of pop culture. You have arrived. You are here, and uh, and you're here to stay. And uh, you know, it's 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 monumental. Think about it. For something to survive and, and keep going and thriving, that's the main thing. Thriving after 50 years, uh, you know, a lot of places don't last that long. And uh, and I'm not just talking specifically Walt Disney World. I'm just talking, you know entertainment mediums or things like that or vacation destinations 50 years is a is a big deal so um it, it's monumental and it, it it's uh it is truly a milestone and and that's the reason we really wanted to do the book that you know put the stake in the ground and say you know this thing that we now call walt disney world that we all uh know and love it's important on so many levels uh, emotionally to people in their nostalgia and we've we've grown up with it now you've had two or three generations that have grown up with walt disney world and for that reason alone it's important and that's why we wanted to do the book yeah now i absolutely love how the final image found in this book is a graphic of the upcoming walt disney dreamers point statue in epcot why was the decision made to have that as the final page of the book <laughs> That was an easy decision for all of us. When we saw that piece of artwork, we went, oh, that's that's it. There, there was no question that the book was going to end with that image. And the reason is, is that there is no Walt Disney World without Walt Disney. He is the beginning of the story, of the Walt Disney World story. And so when we saw that piece of artwork, you know, it, it kind of signifies Walt looking into the future. You know, and he, it's, it's a great, great image of Walt sitting there and... Uh, and we thought that's it. That's that's how we end the book because it's it it it, it does kind of signify of him looking forward, even though he's no longer with us. That creative spirit is still looking forward, and uh, th that there just wasn't any other question that once we saw that piece of artwork, that's the button at the end of the book. Very cool. Now, folks, the book is now available wherever books are sold. I love it, and it would make a great holiday gift for anyone who's a Disney Parks fan in your life. Thank you, Tim, for taking the time to chat today and uh, tell us a bit about the book. Sure, been my pleasure. I hope you all enjoyed today's conversations. I certainly did. On the previous episode, we talked about some Disney news, including a reimagining of Mickey's Toontown in Disneyland Park. And be sure to tune in next week for more Disney news, followed by an episode all about the brand new holiday party at Disneyland called Disney Merriest Nights. The easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of the magic is by subscribing to Disney Coast to Coast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Wherever you search, don't forget it's Disney with a Z, Coast to Coast. You can find any links and info mentioned in this episode by checking out the show notes link in this episode's description. And don't forget to pick yourself up a Disney Coast to Coast 2022 wall or desk calendar featuring all original photos from around the Disney parks at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. Those are only available for a limited time. This episode has been executive produced by Robert Scontrino. Gain rewards like Robert by visiting patreon.com slash Disney with a Z. CTC. And don't forget to leave a voicemail at 818-860-2569 to share your thoughts on today's conversation and the chance to be heard on a future episode. You can find that number in this episode's description along with a link for some free gifts from me to you. Other than that, folks, have a magical day and a happy Thanksgiving for those of you celebrating in America. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast. Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This podcast is part of the DePodcast Network. Learn more about this show, plus find more quality and entertaining podcasts at DePodcastNetwork.com. That's D-E-PodcastNetwork.com.